Heath Kit PS3, Power Supply, 1958. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This is a DC high voltage power supply that was sold as a kit appearing on the Heath Kit catalog 1958. The power supply was advertised for being able to reach 500 volts without load and 200 milliamps at very low voltage. However, actually it could provide between 0 to 450 volts with a current of 10 milliamps at 450 volts up to 130 milliamps at 200 volts. This item came with a red dot centered on the front panel that does not appear on other units visible online. The meaning of this mark is unknown. This item has been shipped, arriving with a bumped cabinet, some tubes out of their socket, and a power transformer that was trying to leave the chassis. This points out that the chassis is very thin compared to the mass of the transformer, which in the presence of vibrations would make the chassis oscillate. Apart from a bad shipment experience, it is important to observe that the front panel and the rest of the cabinet are made of aluminum. That makes them fragile but not affected by rust. This kit was sold with a detailed manual for its construction. The process was so well described that it was not even necessary to number the components. Anyhow, this is the original schematic diagram, edited adding some labels to identify the components more easily. One should observe that the kit did not include a fuse. It is also interesting to observe that there is no ground because on purpose the chassis was kept completely isolated from the circuit so that the output could be grounded freely. The schematics do not provide any information regarding the AC voltages expected at the transformer secondary windings. However, most of them could be guessed based on the function they have. As for the high voltage that feeds the tube type 5V4G, it is about 360 and 360 volts RMS. In fact, considering that with no load, the DC voltage could reach up to about 520 volts, and that probably only maximum 450 volts electrolytic capacitors were available. This explains why it was necessary to put in series two capacitors, here labeled as C1 and C2. The assembly manual describes in detail how this power supply works. The following is quoted from it. It consists of a conventional power supply system, utilizing a 5V4G tube as a full wave rectifier followed by a simple capacity filter. The output is connected to the load terminals through the plate cathode resistance of the parallel 1619 tubes. This resistance may be considered as a variable resistor controlled by the 6SJ7 tube, which is connected so that variations in the output voltage will be reflected as grid voltage fluctuations on the 6SJ7. Corresponding changes in plate current in the tube will appear as bias voltage variations on the grids of the 1619 tubes, since the 6.8 megohm plate load resistor is common to the plate of the 6J7 and the grids of the 1619 tubes. Manual control of the output voltage is accomplished by varying the normal grid bias of the control amplifier tube, 
by adjusting the 500 kilo ohms manual voltage control potentiometer. The 6X5GT rectifier supplies the negative potential that is needed on the cathode of the 6SJ7 control amplifier to keep it within its operating range as the output is varied from 0 to 500 volts. If this negative bias is not supplied, the plate of the 6SJ7 control amplifier would approach cathode potential as the output voltage is reduced, thereby causing the tube to fall out of its operating range. The two 0A2 regulator tubes are used to stabilize the cathode bias of the 6SJ7 tube. The 10 kilo ohms zero adjust control adjusts the negative bias on the 6SJ7 control amplifier when the output voltage control is at zero. This adjustment places the correct bias on the 1619 tubes so that they will produce zero output voltage. The restoration did not require much. The unit was already working and only out of caution, all the capacitors were replaced. The resistors were all still in tolerance and did not require replacing them. However, two fuses were added, one for both input power lines, even though the power plug is polarized. Experimenting, it was necessary to put a couple of 2 amps fast blow fuses because everything less than this blew. Also, the chassis was connected to the external ground for personal preference. This clip shows what happens to the fuses that are close to blowing. Unfortunately, it depends on the moment in which the switch is turned on if there is a significant current surge. The cabinet was cleaned, but not repainted, because it is all made of aluminum. However, the hole on the back has been enlarged to allow the new installed three-prong plug to fit through. The zero adjustment aims to bring the output voltage to zero volts when the potentiometer or 10 is set to zero. It is obtained by adjusting the variable resistor R7. However, the adjustment of R7 can also bring a negative output value. Unfortunately, an accurate and stable zero adjustment is impossible because small fluctuations are always present in the circuit which could lead to an unpredictable small positive or negative output voltage. Here, for example, a small variation of the external line voltage made the output become negative. To avoid reverting the output voltage, it is probably advisable to adjust the zero to a few positive volts. The assembly manual contains an important recommendation on page 13, which might not be included in most versions available online. The following is quoted. It is not advisable to set the power supply at full output voltage of 500 volts under no load conditions for too long a time with the standby switch on. This places an unnecessary stress on the filtering system. The unit is turned on, but keeping it momentarily in the standby off position until it warms up. The unit is tested, connecting a dummy load of 20 kilo ohms to the output terminals. The standby switch is turned on. The output voltage is increased. The meter in the middle of the front panel can be used as a voltmeter or as a millimeter selecting its function with the rotary switch on the right. Now the meter shows the current flowing to the dummy load connected to the output. Reducing the output voltage, also the output current decreases consequently.
The dummy load is reduced to 10 kilo ohms and it is tested up to 250 volts only because the unit would not be able to provide the correct current at higher voltages. The dummy load is increased again to 20 kilo ohms. The behavior of the standby switch is checked. For safety concerns, before turning the unit off, it is a good practice to lower the output voltage to the minimum possible level and to set the standby switch to the off position. If you would like to contribute to this project, Donating old electronics, old equipment, or old radios in whatever condition they might be that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation.